well, I've put some earrings on and a jumper, taking my hoodie off. So it looks, they look nice. Thanks. It does. Well, my the earrings say "cut." So. <laughs> oh yeah, look at that. I'm trying to. I know, I'm definitely reclaiming the word. It's not like you know. I always say it's a place full of depth and warmth. Nimco Ali is on the show today to talk about female genital mutilation, or FGM. I planned this episode to appear now, as I saw it was International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, and it's something I wanted to learn about. I'd often heard about FGM, but didn't actually know all that much about it. I didn't know whether it was a religious custom, or a cultural tradition, or simply a barbaric act carried out on girls by some patriarchal groups. It appears to be the latter. In any case, Nimco is of Somali heritage and was herself cut as a child. She is the co-founder of the Five Foundation, so make sure to get on there and donate, share and support however you can to help end FGM. She also has a prestigious OBE, was named in the BBC's 100 Women, won Red Magazine's Woman of the Year and won the International Women's Rights Award at the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. I read and loved her book, What We're Told Not To Talk About. Link is in the show notes. It is split into categories labelled periods, orgasms, pregnancy and menopause, collecting haunting and inspirational stories from women around the world on each topic. It goes into some quite intense and surprisingly vivid, or quite frankly disgusting in a good way, detail. Uh, Which is one of the book's strengths. It's a lot of fun to read and I found myself both laughing and crying. We discuss what it was like for Nimco to be cut and how it affects her life today. And although this is a very serious topic, Nimco is able to talk at times with humour. So we delve into her previous fancy for English football player Michael Owen and her current interest in conservative politician Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is a bit of a dark horse to say the least. If you get to the end, Nimco tells the men listening how they can get in touch with her to ask her on a date because she hasn't been with someone seriously for five years. I should say, unfortunately, we had some sound issues in this episode. No one's fault, just one of those things where the tech failed us. It means that Nimco's voice is not as audible as one might like, and certainly not to the level to which you listeners are accustomed. I apologise for that. It's a bit gutting, really. I hope you're still able to enjoy it and reach the end. But if you do find it becoming a bit of a strain halfway through and tap out, I'd encourage you to get hold of Nimco's book to learn more about her anyway. I hope this serves to bring her to more ears. If this is your first episode of the podcast, please know the audio is usually much better. See how you go with it. In any case, Nimco is a fascinating person and I'm so lucky to have had her on the podcast. I'll be back at the end. So for people who don't know, and I think a lot of people, uh, especially men perhaps, don't know that much, what, what is FGM and why is it bad? Well, FGM is um, so sort of female genital mutilation, which is the total or partial removal of the female anatomy for non-medical reasoning. And um, the fact that it's bad, it's because it, it's a human rights violation and it's something that not only harms women, but can also kill women as well. Do a lot of people die from it? That's why we use the term survivor, because um, we don't necessarily know the actual numbers of women who've actually died because of FGM at the time it happened or any complications that are linked to it. So I had my FGM when I was seven and I ended up having complications, which meant at the age of 11, I had to have a defibrillation. So I had a really invasive form of FGM, which is type three. There are like different types of FGM, but I just think that's for, more for like medical um uh, medical needs rather than actually understanding that as a lay person but I had a, I had a, a very invasive form of FGM which meant that my anatomy was kind of sealed together which meant that it was really difficult for me to urinate um, as a child that led to a urinary infection which almost kind of led to kidney failure so had I got kidney failure and died from it it would have been as a consequence of my FGM so we don't know how many other girls are out there with those similar complications who are not as lucky as I was in order to have the medical um, expertise I did with with the NHS. So were you already in the UK by that time and do you remember this this time very well? 
Yeah, it's like I remember. So basically, I had a really, um, I had a really idyllic childhood until the age of about six, when we were on holiday in um, what is Somaliland now. So we were in North Somalia, and the war broke out. And then on the way back to the UK, we went by Djibouti, and that's where I had the FGM. So I was very lucid, very aware, uh, but I had no context in, in terms of really understanding what, what it was. And then the next kind of um, three, four years were basically try was my, my family trying to find each other because we, we'd come back. To the UK my uncles were in America so there was like literally displaced family from across the world and it was us moving from Manchester to Cardiff and in that and in that space of time as well like you know I wasn't able to urinate normally and fully clear my bladder so I kept on having like you know um so I ended up developing infections which never really got taken care of and I, and I doubt well I think you, you just don't know as a child when things are um, uncomfortable or, or, mm. or, or painful but yeah, I do remember very um, vividly um, being taken to hospital and waking up and also being very kind of concerned about why nobody was asking me if I was okay. Mm. I think that was for me, that was one of the kind of things that really um, impacted me was the lack of people caring about my well-being rather than the actual act of um, FGM that happened in a, in, 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 in Africa was what, what was happening here in the UK where nobody really cared. Mm. And do, do you remember the time when you had the FGM? Yeah, yeah. So I remember, yeah, I remember the FGM. So I was, I was, I was seven. So I wasn't a child. So I remember it very well. And I remember um, being scorned by the um, cutter herself because I'd run away. Because <gasps> I had no idea who she like if she was the cutter. So that's the kind of I just, I just didn't like the way that she looked. Um, so, so I ran away. And then when I was brought back, she was like, "Do you know how hard it is to find clean utility, like you know, clean instruments?" And 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 I had a local anaesthetic, and she was kind of mm. saying that you are like you know in in the middle of a civil war and a crisis. Your parents are paying money in order for you not just only to have FGM but to have FGM, which is like a lot safer than many many of the other girls that yeah. are having it. So I remember her call, call, um, calling me a brat and. And I think I'm very sensitive to that word still. I know, like, you know, I'm a firstborn wow. and I can sometimes be a little bit demanding, but yeah, um, she called me a brat and I kind of passed out. I'm not sure it was if it, if it was from the shock or something that she gave me, but then I remember, like, the next time I woke up, I was um, being taken to the toilet. Oh, my word. This, this sounds horrific. Yeah, well, it was. It, it was. It was horrific. It was, and also when you're not a child that has, like, you know, fully grown up in Africa and really, like, actually, do you know what? Let me not say that because because all children understand pain and when something's wrong. But for some, for, for a child that's also kind of like extremely confused and able to be able to be in touch with their emotions, I think you do. You are. De- in a civil war and in a place of poverty you are always demanded to grow up a lot quicker than you need to and in the west childhood is something that is obviously legislated and even protected so yeah. the idea of actually just being a child and going through all this then coming back to the uk and then being expected to be the same seven year old as before was um was very strange who is the cutter and is this why is this done is it a religious thing no, it's a basically it's a power and an economic thing. So you pay for FGM. FGM doesn't happen because uh, for um, 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 for free. So it was technically an investment in my future because, like you know, I was to marry a Somali man, and Somali men want their women to be cut. So therefore, in order for me to be to to to, um, to be able to enter the space of being seen as a Somali woman as worthy of being married, which is the only kind of economic protection that women actually have in a state where they're not seen as citizens. Um, so that's what it's, so it was done by a specific person who is trained to be a cutter. And ironically, I had no um, and like I had no um, what's the word knowledge, but but the um, and until about ten about ten, ten years ago that my mother and I were talking about it, maybe maybe it was seven years ago, and it was the same woman that had cut my mother and my aunties that had that, that had carried out the FGM as well um, on me and there's something that I don't have because my, my FGM happened out of context I grew up in the west and I never really was I never really faced or was forced to do a lot of the kind of um, gender specific things that other girls in my culture um, do. But there is this weird kind of um, love between women and their cutters. So there's a woman, um, a girl that I know called Jaha, who's Gambian and she, she has a film called Jaha's Promise. And in that when she goes back to her cutter, there's like a, there's like, there's this like weird connection between them. And when my mother and my auntie, um, about two, so when we, so I found out 
um, like about seven or ten, seven years, seven, ten years ago, that we had the same woman. And then I was in Somaliland um, about three years ago, just after my grandmother died, and I'd seen her cut her for the first time since I had FGM. I'd I'd always refused to see these women, and then and then I came to the dinner table and I said to my mum, oh. Um, and my auntie, her younger sister, I said, oh, I saw this woman who's a cutter and she looks so bad. I just said, it must be like all the evil. And then honestly, it was a weird psychological thing. So I was sitting there at the table and then, they, and, and, and then my auntie said that she saw so-and-so. And I said, who's done? It's like, and it was the woman that cut them. And my mom was like, how is she? And it was just like very kind of affectionate, like, you know, way of really trying to find out about the well-being of your cutter. And I'm just thinking, that is just so bizarre. But that's what I mean about this, like, there's there's, there's, there's a lot of psychology behind this as well that people don't necessarily um, understand. Presumably your auntie and mother are not or were not upset about being cut. I mean, the fact that they got, they got it, they made it happen to you, they must have been quite proud or happy with it. Yeah, they just basically, they, they saw it as being symbolic of being a Somali woman. And I think, but even to now, it, it was a lot more shameful about me talking about FGM rather than having mm. FGM. Mm. How, how, how are they about you talking about FGM and, and the book and everything? I think they're fine. They're fine now. But it took a long time for us to get to the space that we are. And I think for me, I was very much angry at my mum for a long time. And then I realised actually when... Like, you know, at the time when I had FGM, she was 27. So she was literally 20 years older than me. She was a child herself. And she had very little control about the fact that whether I should or should not have FGM. But what she had control over was the way that I was educated and raised when she had, when she was living in a a democratic country um, and able to make choices. And she made choices that have allowed me to be as independent as I am. So... And, and, and I've also got to the position where actually I am more over my FGM than any other woman that I know in my life. So I'm beyond the FGM. I've, I've, I've learned to embrace it, live with it, and understand that I can actually exist outside of one symbolic act that happened to me. So I realized just before my grandmother died, actually, that I kind of, I, I had the ability to forgive my mum rather than demanding forgiveness. And for a long time, I was, I was expecting her to be in a position which, like she never had the privilege to be in that position, but I had that I had that privilege to be in that position. So yeah, we're like we're good, and I think it's okay. about also understanding that your parents are not um, like you know are flawed; they're not all perfect. Hmm. I still can't get my head around why Somali men want women to have that. Is that is that because they're afraid that if they are able to feel more pleasure, then they might uh, go and cheat on them or something? Is it that? No, it's just like, honestly, I don't think they've ever really sat down and thought thought, thought about it because it's been happening for um, hundreds of years and they've never really known a Somali woman that wasn't cut anyway. So therefore, they just therefore just accept that. I think Somali women, are, Somali men are changing now, but then mm. it's all about having those kind of conversations. And I think in terms of like, um, it's not just FGM, the way that women's um, say sexuality is kind of policed and the way that they're chastised for actually even having the audacity to even like, you know, talk about issues like um, sex and sexuality um, that, like, you know, happens in different ways. So, yeah, I, I, um, I think it is a very conservative and it is a very patriarchal um, culture. And, mm. like, someone like me is actually, um, what can I say, is a is an odd one out. And not only, not only do I speak the way I speak about um, FGM and the fact I've had it, but I'm still kind of like, I haven't, I haven't been broken by it. I think that's what FGM, what FGM is meant to do is actually, it's meant to break you and make you, and make sure that you Mm. stay in your lane. You seem to suggest in the book that it's, uh, it's reversible or to some extent, uh, and was it a, was it called a clitoroplasty? Yeah, so clitoroplasty is like reconstructing the clitoris. I like you know, I the, the whole point is that sometimes a lot of that is um, psychosomatic as well. I don't know how much of like there, there's very little research that's actually done in terms of being able to fully um, have um, like feelings or having the kind of orgasms that you might have had, whether you have whether you you, you, mm-hmm. you didn't have FGM. But the reason why it's called FGM and not FTC, which a lot of people want to call it cutting, the act is cutting, the, the, the consequences are mutilation. So you can have, you can remedy it, but you can't fully um, fix the damage that's done. And so does that mean that people who have been cut, so to speak, are, are never able to climax or can they enjoy sex still? 
No, they can definitely. So I think I, I think we focus very much about like you know adult women and sexuality rather than the fact that this is a form of violence that happens to children. And you can have say you can like you know have sex um, and you can have um, orgasms. But I think one of the one of the reasons why women haven't been able to enjoy sex after FGM is because they're all like you know m- many of these women are cut before they're married and the people they're married to or or they're cut in in order for them to get married. Um, and 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 the people that they're married to are people that they didn't choose to marry. Mostly are people who who, who are selfish with the um, the act of sexual pleasure and think that it's that it's that it's just for them and not, and not, um, and not for the woman. So, um, like I said to somebody once, when they said like, "Can women like you have an orgasm?" It's, it's not necessarily to do with the woman. It's more to do with the man and how either attentive and how consensual the sexual relationship is. So I think. Yeah. A lot of women who had FGM are having sex with men who did it, who they did not consent to have sex with. So there's a yeah societal factor as well, but I suppose the, so. The, so physically, you're telling me it's still. And the reason I asked, the reason I'm so upfront about it, I suppose, is because I feel like um, the physical sensations of sex is is pretty much a fundamental human right for everyone, even if we don't like to talk about it. Uh, that's pretty fundamental. That's that's a huge part of who we are. It's a human right to be able to enjoy sex for yourself but i don't think the idea of so again like that's another kind of i don't think that you have the right to sex so i think that comes into another conversation where men actually assume that prostitution is a thing because women sometimes some way um think that they owe them the right to sex. but yeah so sexual pleasure the idea to be able to enjoy sex is is i think a basic kind of tendency it's, it's like happiness it's like happiness help and all these other um kind of things but to be fair there are very few people that actually are confident and able to enjoy sex whether they've had fgm or not which is one of the things i found out in the book which i just found really depressing because I, I i like you know i grew up in the west and i saw how hypersexual everything was so i just thought that you guys were just like having orgasms all the time until i found out that actually very few women um, in in the West are actually having orgasms, which is just like, I think this is massively depressing. And that's what was so wonderful about the book, I suppose. What, what's the response been from people about that book? How have you, how have you found that? It's, you know what I didn't, I haven't done as much PR as because the whole point is actually, it is very kind of, I am very open in it, and especially in the paperback as well. I like very, very, very much open about my own experiences, but it's been very like well received, and and it's um, and I've and I've got some really lovely messages from men who have said like you know I picked this up because I I you like, know read, read about your work around FGM and I was like really empowered by it. So it's been really well received. I have actually haven't had a negative um, review or somebody. I actually really did think that people would say that it was a little bit heteronormative because this is because. That's a word that's like buzzing around, but it wasn't. I haven't got any, I haven't got any pushback in that kind of sense as well because I think I want to talk about the four stages of what, 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 like you know to be a woman. And- it was really quite shocking, and it's really funny looking through Goodreads because uh, just looking at the ratings and stuff because it's got amazing reviews. It's like all five stars, um, okay. and then every now and then there's like a one star from someone who's like this. This was using horrible words and saying, th-, and it was like, well, the book is oh, called. I haven't, like- seen, I haven't seen that. I just haven't. Like, w- w- what are they are they confused about with the word cunt or vaginas? Or? <laughs> I think it was actually the period slugs that sent one woman over the edge. Okay, well, it's just you know what happens. It's like it's weird. I think one of the things I'm not sure know. what like you know what context men probably men would if they if they got a like when men blow their nose. <laughs> I'm sure they look at what they what's come out of there. I think all of us <laughs> women look at what's come out of our um, anatomy. It's just like. It's just the thing. It's like it's sometimes just incredibly amazing. I so enjoyed it. I, I'm a big believer in any kind of art, whether it's a movie or a book or whatever. It's supposed to make you feel a sensation you haven't felt before. It's supposed to move you in yeah. a certain way. And your book certainly does that. And, and not just in this sort of fun way like that. I mean, I loved reading about that stuff because it's just men. We don't even think about it. And I was amazed that I thought it was just one particular person was talking about a slug. And it, that theme came up time and time again of sort of yeah. a brown slug appeared in their whatever, in their underwear, that 
that was their period that was the realization and just how daunting and and what is that like for a woman the thing is like you're more likely to have a period than more of the other things so the whole point is you might not live long enough to have menopause you may never get pregnant and you may never have an orgasm because you might choose to be a nun or you might just be mm-hmm. dating men who are shit in bed <laughs> but um but ultimately, but ultimately <laughs> it's like you will have a period i think that's more likely than anything else out of the whole four stage of that um that kind of book and it is the whole thing's like that first bit is literally like the slugs that you see in, in the autumn in, in your part um in your pathway and like you know mm-hmm. on the way to work and stuff like that that just made me think i wasn't going to ask this actually i have no idea what your thoughts are on this but there's been quite a hoo-ha recently that i imagine you've heard about a little bit about saying um that all women have periods because it offends certain sections of sort of the trans community and stuff i mean where do you where do you stand on that um well, women with ovaries have periods. Do you have to say that though? Do you have to specify women? No, you don't. I just, no, I just say actually no. They say people have periods. But they say people that have periods rather than women have periods because not all women have periods apparently. Yeah. So, so the thing is like yeah, I, like you know the whole point is I believe in trans rights, but I think I work in an issue where the fact that actually like sex based, um, like you know, I, sex based, I gender or sex is a thing is like girls can't identify themselves out of fgm and girls can't identify themselves out of need and needing access to contraception is a reality and i just yeah i just think when it comes to things about violence against women and girls and violence against trans um, women it's men that are committing those violence and we're actually on the same side so the idea the fact that you are offended that you don't bleed. It's just like, do you know what? Imagine, like, you know, from the age of 12, like, you know, once a month um, having shit come out of your um, anatomy, which is quite painful. It's not anything, actually. It's not, it's not, it's not a luxury. I think that's the idea, is the fact that a lot of people think being a woman is a luxury. And I think it, it probably is the a, a tiny minority of trans people who are actually yeah. making a fuss about uh, whether it says women on, on a Tampax boxes and stuff like that. So your book is a rich tapestry of just amazing stories. And they're so different as well. You've got everything from sort of post-death sperm donation to just yeah the slug-like periods and all these kinds of things. Where did you find a lot of the stories? Um, it's just like conversations that I've always been like, you know, having or, or had and then being able to kind of trace back those women and have and have that um, and, and, and be able to kind of say, like, you know, we had a story five, six years ago. Can we please sit down and like, you know, and, and talk about this? Because I've been so open about my experience of FGM. Women have talked to me about their anatomy and so um and and an experience about the anatomy is there's there's one story in there about, about the woman who ended up getting um cervical cancer. It was 2017. We it was it was it was during the um elections. I was standing for the women's equality party and it was in the back garden of someone's house in Crouch End. I'm like I need to record this because it's like it's really powerful. So so so, so those are the kind of things I've always been very much able to have. I think what my friends what my ex used to say is that if, they, if there's one thing you have is a um, good chat. Like, I don't have good chat in order to chat with somebody that I fancy, but I have good chat to kind of, like, I, I can get, get along with anybody if I, if, I, if I need to. That's a big part of being a writer and a journalist, I suppose, soaking up people's experiences. Presumably they were they were speaking them to you because there were parts where they said, oh, God, you know, I can't believe I'm crying while talking to you. And so you're sort of writing it down. I recorded it. So it's just kind of like having that conversation. Of, because the whole point is I wanted to feel like, I think, have my voice through the whole thing. It's like I am having this conversation with them. And it's like, and it's the way that, that, that we would talk Um in terms of their kind of conversation. So it was like a documentary in the sense of like, you know, capturing that moment in their life and nobody had kind of asked them before. And sometimes I wish I would have set the context of the space it was happening in because, but I didn't want to do that because I wanted every woman to feel that this could be them. So the whole, from East London to Ethiopia, we're all having these kind of like, you know, experiences. Like there are some people who are like, you know, it's identifiable like Yasmin about um, about a refugee, being a, being a refugee and so on. But for that, one I think for me what really stood out is like when I was having the conversation with her she was a lot older she was living in Germany at the time um it was it was more about the fact that how she really looked at like you know because they always say that having your period is that transition from girlhood to womanhood and she was just talking about this whole point of how selfish she was like just like using all the pads that her mother had left Syria with and not really assuming that anybody else actually really mattered and that's a very childlike thing 
like you know when you're just going to eat all the cookies because you think they're all for you because everybody else is it's an adult so for, for me that was what really stood out in that story it's really funny you mentioned that one because i was about to myself because that was my favorite of what it's what it's very early on in the book and yeah. for some reason you never know what's going to hit you emotionally and most of the stories are emotional some of them are funny and different and crazy um but that one it exactly what you said it was something about something always gets me crying if i'm it's something about childlike innocence and her looking back as an adult thinking about they were walking from syria to i thought it was germany but then it was they were in greece by the end I, I've, so basically so they got so, so they got asylum in germany but they walked through in terms of like getting all the way like you know going from syria to live like you know just coming all the way through um and taking that kind of treacherous um um, kind of voyage into into Europe, but they were yeah. So they were in a refugee camp. So she was like, when she started a period, it was in a refugee camp in um, in Greece, but they ended up getting asylum in Germany. Imagine going through that. Imagine that your first period with the the emotion that would go with, accompany that, and you're, you know, you're a refugee. That's awful. And and as I say, the the innocence at the time, and then looking back as an adult and thinking about. Yeah what it was like for her mother to give her her final pads and have to sort of make do with whatever she was doing, her mother on her own. And the kids, as you said, like cookies, like just taking them for herself, which was just totally normal and understandable. Every child yeah. would do that. But it just felt so bad for her now as an adult looking back on that story that will always be with her. And it just suddenly just hit me. There's a wave of emotion with that one. It's so sad. No, but you know what? That's that's one of the things that I one of the things that I really took away from this, and it actually helped me to heal with my mom mm -hmm. was the fact that we're all we all struggle in our different ways in order to be a parent and to be kind of have that relationship with our parents, to be a child, and and you'll never understand your parents until you become one yourself. Mm -hmm. And for me, sometimes what I also never, what, what I always laugh about was the fact that my teenage years, I used to think like I was the smartest person in the world. I was the most incredible. And I would just sit here like almost like, you know, in my late thirties thinking I was so dumb. I'm lucky that I didn't actually die from some of the stupid things that I, like, you know, that I thought I was invisible. I think that level of people keeping you um, alive and you thinking you know better, but I think there's like this whole cycle that kind of so that, that allowed me to see my mother as a human being as opposed to a mother at first. Like we solemn um, see our parents as humans. We, we always expect them to be superhuman and see them as parents and, and, and nothing else. And I just, and I think for me as well, but I never really looked at it before, but when my mom was diagnosed with cancer um, in 2008, 2009, mm. I remember my uncles coming over and, and then my grandmother came over and it was this whole kind of thing of the, the fact that I, I thought, and my siblings, I don't know my siblings, but I thought I was the most important relationship to her. But I just thought to myself, well, I thought, I thought now, I didn't think at the time that my mother existed before I was born. It's a really weird thought, isn't it? That you'll have kids, or I, I might have, I don't have kids now, so I might have kids. And this period now of my life, which is which is central to my existence, this is everything, right? This is going to be, yeah. they won't even imagine that this happened. They won't care. No, it's not even imagine. They don't care. So the whole point is they're thinking like they're very selfish. And then, but they'll, but then that's your, the gift of being a great parent is f for them to sit one day and actually think, oh God, my dad was actually once a boy. I think the same as you, I, I guess that is a real part of aging that we all go through when you reach your 30s and 40s and you look back on your teenage years when, as you say, you feel totally invincible. I thought I knew everything. And the older you get, I suppose, the more you you realize you know nothing. And I suppose that, that must be a sign of maturing to some extent. Yeah, and also a sense of a sense of actually accepting that you're not the most important thing on the planet. I'll get there one day. It's hard to remember, but hopefully you will. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I, I know I'm not the most important person. Just just about. So so yeah, in the book you're not explicitly uh, critical of religion, and there are a lot of religious stories, and you're not explicitly mm. um, critical of men as such in general. It's more of a focus on individual people. Was that an important thing to hammer home? Yeah, definitely, because I'm. Um, it's the, in terms of men, is the whole point is I'm I'm a heterosexual woman. <laughs> so mm -hmm. even in the, in the in the in the sector that I work in, it makes it like you know I deal with the most horrific uh, you know examples of the male species every day. But I still have to kind of get my subcon like my conscious get a conscious focus to think actually you know what I need to be able to be able to love and respect and date one. And I've met some great men like like my grandfather was one of the greatest human beings that I met. And I think that I think about religion is the fact that I've got respect for religion. I'm I am. Um, 
I'm agnostic. I was raised a Muslim, educated a Catholic. Um, a lot of my friends are Jewish. I like, you know, I'm not anti-faith. I'm anti-organized religion and the way that it operates sometimes through the through the through the patriarchy. So that's something that I think to have a conversation about. This wasn't about politics. It was actually about people, and it was always about having a conversation. And I wanted everybody to be able to be to basically be included in that so your like your sexuality your faith and your race mm-hmm. have no bearing in the fact that we do actually share a common experience um as women which some people might not be saying that like you know the, the concept of gender or sex doesn't exist but it actually does for like you know um for billions of women out there one of the things i really found quite fascinating and and liberating as well about the book you know the whole concept of we're going to talk about things that people don't talk about and i think people presume of course there's going to be maybe the exciting things like orgasms or the things about how they don't work sex doesn't work and stuff like that but one that really stayed with me was this idea that some mothers want to kill their children some mothers want to hate their their babies in the first years um, because we are given a very clean and pure idea of this maternal love a lot of the time which is just like you have it must it must put a lot of pressure it's a pressure I felt myself I again I don't have children but I thought if I did I've already worried sometimes uh, what if I don't love that child as much as I'm supposed to and I think that's something that nobody that's such a taboo to say that either parent might not love their child so you know what? one of my best friends so, so i'm going to tell you the advice that my um auntie gave my sister-in-law um about success and parenting in the first year she said well she said in the first six six to nine months if you don't throw yourself or the baby out the window you are an incredible mom so you have to set the context of like what incredible parent who was like and then my best friend recently said um they were talking about having kids and he's like imagine if my kid is not funny <laughs> I was like, and he's like, because the whole point is like, like, some people do have, like, it's okay. I always think, like, you should never think that your child is the most incredible thing in the world and they never wish it wasn't born every day. It's fine to actually just, it's fine to actually dislike your children mm-hmm. just as much as it's like, or it's also fine for your, for children to dislike their parents. Like the whole point, like, you know, the whole point you can say to like, you know, you can respect your dad, but not love him in, in, in the sense that you can fall short from the, from the man that you would have expected him to be or all the things or the human that you wish would have raised you. Let's humanize being parents and let's humanize the ability of, um, of making mistakes as parents and, 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 try, and trying to make up for those things. So my mother, like, didn't like mean to harm me but she did a, but she did a really st- a stupid thing that she had no control over and the idea the fact that i said that my mom was like i didn't say my mom was stupid but people thought i said that and even then i'm like but well, why can't your parents be stupid why can't your parents be silly <laughs> mine certainly are the way i'm saying i'm explaining but you said that like very comfortably in my kind of culture it's like oh god i can't say that because i was also i was raised that um the heaven lies um, beneath the feet of your mother so this idea of the fact that well, hmm. you have to love your parents no matter what and i think that's for me in my culture that's a really interesting thing that like very few people are critical of their parents and then they don't really know how to parent anybody themselves after that I should add that I was I was joking about my parents being stupid because I know I know they'll listen so so I'm winding them up. Yeah, no, but exactly. No, but that's what I mean. But the whole point is that you can joke about it. I just think I'm going to go to hell if I do. Growing up like that, it must just be oh, just always. What oh, what if I go to hell all the time? Yeah, exactly. But thankfully, my mom wasn't like she wasn't like abusive in you know in, like the like you know outside of the context of like this one act of FGM and what happened and, and the things that she believed and so but people that are kind of in those kind of families and, and I used to see that and I just think I used to like mate you can't like you know like they can't do that and they're like yeah but it's my mom what, what, what can I do I'm like like just <clears throat> so it was just yeah it was just really weird like I know a lot of people who like really really evil mums loads of evil mums yeah but like the whole point is like when you're forcing your daughter to get married or stay with an abusive husband and all these other kind of things that's like really really evil just for just 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 for you to save face within the community you know what i'm wondering as well um there's sort of a balance when you when you're critiquing another culture and of course you're not critiquing another culture but i am by proxy when you're critiquing a culture how does one balance uh deciding what is right and and stopping bad things from happening with being a sort of a, a moral imperialist going to other cultures for example the, the burqa or the niqab where does that stand compared to fgm in terms of you know people from the west telling others that they're these are good or bad things well see the whole point is like and i was actually having this conversation today it's the burqa is not necessarily the burqa is not just 
a piece of material or something that people wear or it's not a costume or a religious thing it's a political statement so it comes with it comes with like real ideology and real beliefs and really interestingly enough like none of the people that i know that wear the burqa here would actually live in a country where the where, where the burqa's principles are enforced so they wouldn't want to they wouldn't want to live in saudi iran or these places but yet they'll want to kind of create a similar kind of um separation between actual civilization and the country that they're living in so that's completely different so the whole point is i i can like if somebody says i want to wear the burqa i'm like fine wear the burqa the whole point it doesn't mean i have to like it but then also at the same time i'm going to say to you that we live in a country which actually accepts like you know equal rights for men and women voting is um voting is okay polygamy is wrong all those things and you have the and you have the right to actually express the things which you respect in a democracy and in this country and where there's a kind of freedom. Other stuff like FGM, it's like if you if you wouldn't want it to happen to you, then you can, you, you're allowed to say that. Because I remember when somebody, so there's a guy I went out on a, well, it wasn't a date, we were having a conversation and I said, what did you study? Um, and he said, anthropology. And I said, the only form, the only thing that is acceptable as anthropology is the shop. Because like the idea, the fact that white people can go around the world and study people because they look different it's actually quite offensive like nobody comes over here and starts studying white people and then this and and then he started talking about fgm um and he said but no but the whole point is like culture you're not talking about culture like, what culture is that like I'm like you know there's literally nothing that actually upholds that and he said no but we have to be non-judgmental i said i'm actually gonna like the fact that you're standing there saying that you're not going to judge somebody holding down a child and taking a knife to their anatomy for no reason at all other than they just want to like what is actually wrong with you? Like you, mm. if that was in the middle of the street and people were doing that, would you think it's okay? And he said, well, it depends. I'm like, see, so I think it's actually more racist for you to have this kind of like, oh, I don't want to be an imperialist white person because then that shows that you actually morally think that your rights are superior to those of young brown girls. Mm. That's a similar thing to what um, Yasmin Mohammed said on this podcast last week. She was saying exactly that. You know, why why was it why is it all right for a, a young white girl to be free and do what she wants, and people will get up people will get upset if her rights are taken away. But when it's a, a young Muslim girl from somewhere else, then people were like, "Oh, you better leave them." You know, that it's a reverse racism yeah. kind of thing. Either I'm British or I'm not. It's either the law applies to me equally or it doesn't because this idea of the fact that there has to be um, like a lens of my culture. Like my culture is like, like it is the United Kingdom. It's like you, you can't have the, um, two dual um, moralities and legislation working together. Either either the people that live in here that are paying taxes and doing these things either abide by the law or, or they don't. And if they don't, then it's fine for you as a citizen to say actually, this is unacceptable because I remember a Somali guy I was having this conversation with and he said, oh, but the whole point is like, we don't know FGM is illegal. We, we need we need to be educated. And I said, where do you live? And he said, Bristol. I said, so, so I was from Bristol. I said, so what So what area in Bristol do you live in? And then he told me, I said, oh, actually, I said, so, so what did the bins go out in so-and-so? And he said, oh, Wednesday. I'm like, if you can figure out the system of actually taking your bins out, mm. And you can also take your kids to school. You don't get um, fines when you're parking around Bristol. You know that FGM is illegal. Like the idea of the fact that a bunch of white people here going, oh yeah, you don't understand FGM is illegal. I'm like, this man abides by every single law in this country, apart from the one that's harming his daughter. I, what is actually wrong with you? So people are just like, he doesn't like, honestly, he doesn't go going to the shops and start nicking things because he knows that like, you know, yeah. a theft is like illegal. So we have to, we have to be able to, to stop assuming that people of color or like ethnic minorities are dumb because yeah. they play on that. And I, and I know that because I'm from the community and they will play dumb to a, to, to, um, to a lot of things and be able to make you feel guilty and then, and then get away with the harm that they're causing mostly to women and girls. Yeah. I'm from a, a Jewish family, but atheist, secular, and uh, it's definitely something that what you're talking about, but exactly what you're describing is something I've seen in the Hasidic Jewish community, this playing dumb thing, and they sort of, and just people let them do what they want, so the education yeah. and the way they treat women and girls is, is also really quite horrific. And also I should add that, that and I'm not, not being funny, but I actually don't know uh, when the bins are taken out. Uh, where I am and I get confused because it's all written different I don't know what is glass and what is all that but I do but I do know that FGM is illegal but you get your so so you so you've never had your bins emptied 
well we i live in like an, a, a a complex in berlin but you don't need well, that's the whole point so then you don't need to you just kind of put them in a like yeah, the big communal, bins. Yeah, yeah, but there's loads of big bins and they're all saying really sort of angry looking German words going like, oh, that's is der Müller. And I'm like, I don't know which of these things. So I'm just saying I do struggle with that. And I sort of, you know, it's, it's an admission here and I'm going to get some flack for this. But sometimes if my girlfriend's not watching and people, I just sort of just throw it because I don't, I'm so confused and I think I'm getting it wrong anyway. But I've gone off topic, but it's, a, you know, it's maybe another podcast to have. Bins are, well, bins are a very British thing. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it's a very British thing. It's just like I've taken um no, it's like yeah. I know mine go up on a Wednesday night for the Thursday collection, but we have an alternation of um like the recycling gets picked up every week. I don't know, why, why are we talking about bins? This, this no, but you're right, you're right, because now I know, I remember my mum is often talking about the bins and when and I don't really relate to that because I've been living in different countries and I'm always in some sort of apartment complex thing. But she's always yeah. very like, you know, oh, those bins are going out today. So that is a, it is a big thing. So yeah. But it's a social, but that's what I'm saying to you. It's a social norm. I was just trying to use the excuse of the social norm in a community context where if yeah. you don't take your bins out, then your bins start smelling and everybody else in the community says to you like, what's wrong with you? So therefore I'm saying to these people, if nobody else in your bloody street or in Bristol is actually cutting their daughter, you also know that you shouldn't be cutting your daughter. <sighs> But presumably, presumably others of Somali uh, heritage are also doing it. So they might have friends who are also doing it. It's not the norm in the street. It's not the norm in a city. Has it um, affected your own dating and stuff? There was a story in the book, of course, of somebody who was was dumped by someone that they loved very much when they realised that they had they had FGM done. And has that been a problem that you face and many others who have been cut face? No, well, it's, it's, it's different. I can't speak for all women, but for me, it's more it's, it's more about the fact that because of my activism and how open I've been about things, a lot of people have, like, probably sit there on a date and think more about my vagina than I want them to on a first date. <laughs> so, um, and I think it's kind of impacted in terms of, like, the way that I date. Because, like, for a long time, I only dated Somali men because, I like, if I was thinking if anything was going to go further, then I didn't want them to have a... Um, shock but yeah it has like I think it was more emotional for a long time than it actually was physical but um, and now I just don't have the time or I just can't be bothered dating right now mm. but it's been five years but yeah so since you were last with somebody important yeah but everybody's just like so boring no offence <laughs> to men out there but you are quite boring yeah I am a bit boring I, I totally get it and I've got more boring as I got older so I think maybe we are what kind of excitement would you want in somebody? No, I mean, like, funny and kind of like, elite, I don't know, but it's just like, I don't mind just somebody that's quite whatever, but it's just like, that's so routine and just so kind of like, I think what I mean by boring is like this whole idea of the fact that, like, you know, people have like angsts over um, settling down, all these things. I don't know, people, people just like freak out about really um, weird things and I don't necessarily have time or energy for that. I need somebody yeah. that's kind of like, Got their got their shit together in in the, the sense that they're not being manic all the time. Yeah, are you done with it then? Are you just have you given up on men? I have actually. Yeah, this is I haven't got the energy to like to bother to get into know somebody. But I think mm. post COVID, I might I might see what I can see from the rejection bin. I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna I'm gonna go sift. I'm gonna sift through the ones that I you know that I cancelled. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to? It's getting personal, but it's quite a personal. Uh, book and issue and everything. Uh, do do you want children and stuff like that, or is that, have you been put off that? Well, I've um, I froze my eggs um, during the first lockdown, so like yeah. ideally I would like to have children. But I would like to have children with somebody that like I would like to have children with somebody that I'm with rather than the idea of just having children. So mm. if I don't meet somebody, I'm not like you know I'm not that precious about say like you know the fact that i'm just going to have children with any um person that's out there which some which some of my kind of um friends just really want to be parents also they go into sperm donation and so on so yeah so um that would be a thing like if i like for, like for example if i had a one night stand now and got, and got pregnant would i want to keep it i don't know i'm not that into like necessarily wanting to have kids do you meet much resistance from people who are you know presumably pro fgm are there a lot of pro fgm people who are annoyed at people like you 
Yeah, they well, there are a lot of pro FGM people out there, but like they're not that annoyed with me anymore because they just think I'm a lost, um, I'm a whore. <laughs> so it was like, no, I don't know what they think anymore because I don't really engage with them as much as I used to. Um, but there are a lot of people that were very much um, trying to silence me and were very, and were actually very violent towards me at the beginning. But now it's like, you know, it's a lot easier and there's a lot, but like, you know, because one, I don't engage, um, engage with them. And I think because I've, I've, I've kind of developed enough um political and social clout that they don't like you know how is your work affecting the world and and are things changing are you feeling hopeful about the future for fgm well not the hopeful for fgm but you know what i mean yeah yeah no no i'm i am really hopeful for the fact that fgm will end i think covid has been a bit of a um has thrown a spanner in the works in the in in the sense that um a lot, a lot more girls work up because of covid because all the ngos and everything else pulled out but it also kind of made the case in, in terms of the five foundation which we found which i co-founded in 2019 that uh well, t- well towards the end of 2018 and it's 2019 uh, the fact that actually empowering and investing in african women is 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 the only way to do this so a lot of the girls who are who, who 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 could be subjected to FGM haven't been born yet, and most of those girls. Um, children are going to be born to adolescent young women who've already undergone FGM. If we can support them and we can invest in them, not only do we reduce the population of the continent of Africa, but about we also give women choices. So to the point when they have kids, then they're able to choose not to want to have to subject them to FGM. So yeah, I am hopeful. I think there is a tangible reality of FGM ending in our lifetime. Why is it you get, um, I've seen you've been upset by, some, some journalists ask, uh, what about male circumcision? So why are they so different in your mind? Well, it's completely like foreskin is not a clitoris. You have to kind of like the equivalent. But the, let me start off by saying, actually, I despise male circumcision. I actually think it's ridiculous. Um, it makes, it has no kind of, because um, we were talking, because someone was telling me, oh, it's cleanliness. I'm like, yeah, like, you know, 2000 years ago, okay, when there was no soap and water, but now we're living in the 21st century and it actually makes no sense. And it's not literally, it's not a religious requirement. It's just a preference for men, for their sons to look like them. Um, I had this really interesting conversation once with um, somebody saying, I said, oh, I said, oh, men, that, um, men that are uncircumcised, they're better in bed. Like people get so angry, like circumcised men get so because you can never have a, a really um what's the word i'm looking for um balanced view about male circumcision with men if they've been circumcised because they just can't hear about anybody with a foreskin hang on hang on i've been men. i've been circumcised and i'm perfectly happy to me it's, it's, pro- it's probable that that other men are, are better in bed no, no, I was, gonna ask, I was gonna ask you this comments because when you said that you're from a Jewish family but secular, I was, I was gonna say, were you circumcised and, and and how do you feel about your sons being circumcised? How do you feel about your sons being circumcised? It's it's something that um yeah, I think about that a lot. And you know what, you touched on something that which I, I'm I'm a little bit undecided, but but what's really interesting is that bit of one of the main reasons is because you want your son to look like you, and isn't it weird if your son doesn't look like you? And I thought that is the creepiest argument for something. Like the idea that you're walking around, yeah, my dad's willy is different to my willy. Like who, who cares? <laughs> I very rarely look at my dad's willy. But that's what I'm saying to you. That's what. That's how sometimes with the FGM, when 98% of women in the Somali community have been cut, imagine the fact that you not being cut. It's this whole kind of. But even. But the difference between male and female, um, like you know, FGM and male circumcision is it's the it's basically the drastic nature of the act and also the consequences of women's lives in, in terms of health and everything else, and then how the lived experience of women kind of changed. So when FGM happens, other forms of like you know gender based violence happen when male circumcision happens men get the keys to the kingdom so they get like a pat on the back and um everything else but yeah i just literally it is that whole thing it's like i sit around with my jewish friends and they just can't deal with like their sons not looking like them i'm thinking that is just so weird man literally you're thinking about the non-existent foreskin of your children yeah i don't think i would it would obviously i'd have to consult the the other person involved in the making of said future baby but the thing that male circumcision really pisses me off about is the fact that women will give up cheese, eggs, and all these things to do in pregnancy. They will carry that baby to get immunized, but for no reason other than the fact that 4,000 years ago, a man gave his foreskin to God, apparently. They would, they would subject the most important organ I'm gonna, I'm one, of the most, one of the most important organs of that child's healthy body to this horrific act that could actually, like, you know, 
um, result in not just like mental scarring, but a physical scarring that could damage his ability to use that. It's just, mm-hmm. Honestly, if you, if you really think about it logically, it's like, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think it's, obviously there, it is very different, as you've said, to female genital mutilation. Because I don't feel, I don't care. It's just whatever you know. It is what it is. It's, well, that's why it's more ridiculous. Because with female um, you know, mutilation with um, FGM, it's barbaric. It's wrong, and also people do it in order to oppress women. So at least you can see the power dynamics of this whole thing. This, I, but why? I don't know why. <laughs> I couldn't tell you why. I think if we actually stop male circumcision, we might be able to stop FGM. Is it we mm-hmm. like? It's just like it just makes no sense. So, yeah. and loads of Americans get it when they're not even religious, don't they? Loads of Americans. Well, because again, it was it was Kellogg's that like you know the the Wakers that did it, and then all these men wanted their sons to look like them. So when the first generation of huh. like you know of these guys that I think it was like, it was like seventy, it was like, I think it was like seventy percent of like. Um, and actually, I think I think most I think most black men are also circumcised. Yes, yes. The, the, but, sorry, I just said yes as if I was just imagining in my mind's eye all the black men I know and their penises. But I do have a recollection. <laughs> I didn't mean to admit to that, but I think back at like obviously primary school, we all used to shower together. Yeah. And that was something that I'm now I'm now remembering that I was familiar with, and of course Muslim boys as well. Yeah, yeah, also, but Caribbean boys, which is actually quite. Because I've never actually said. I've never, I said to somebody the other day. She said that there was somebody in. Um, it was London as well. She said, oh, "I've never seen." I said, she's, "She's an English girl." Um, I've never had a sex with a man with with, with a foreskin. And I said, "Look at her." I said, are "You are you are you just dating Jews and Americans?" And she's like, "Yeah, and Caribbeans." And I was like, "What? Like, imagine being a girl from East London that's never actually slept with a guy with foreskin. It's just bizarre." That is bizarre. <laughs> so yeah, I don't really get like I just. I find it more fascinating to talk about because he actually does talk about the social psych, like the, like the psychology of the whole um, kind of thing. Well, people are tribal, aren't they? And that's where that thing of you need to look like the other person. You know, if it's important yeah. for someone who's a football fan to wear the same colours as the other people in the football team, it's more important that for those people that your genitals look like the genitals of your tribe or your clan or whatever it is. Which is bizarre, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. If I ever did do it, I think if I had a child, I'd have a proper look into it and I'd sit down with a doctor or something. And and I probably wouldn't do it. Doctor's going to say to you, it's unnecessary. So the Mm. idea, and there's a really good campaign in America that's called I Did Not Consent, which is basically men holding up pictures of themselves um, before they're brisk. Is that what it is? Is that called brisk? The ceremony when you're seven or eight days old, I think it is. Yeah. Because again, even then, it's like you're being kind of like sacrificed. You'd be like on this white pillow, and I, I, I said to a, um, a rabbi friend of mine, I said, I said, and also, why are you like, you know, why are you putting your lips on the baby penis? And he's like, we're not putting my lips. And I'm like, he's like, he's like, we don't even do that anymore. We use a straw. I'm like, do you know how weird that is? You put a straw Sorry, on a baby's. That, is that what happens? Because I, I thought I, I was going to mention that before, and I thought that's no, that must be a myth. Is that actually is that orthodox or is that everyone? I know. I think it's all the orthodox. I don't think it's everyone. I think it's like it's like it's like. Well, but I just, but I just still said to him like, but he was like, he was like a proper Jewish um, guy. And he was, I know. And I just was like, and he's a friend. So I just, I was, I was like, I'm not winding you up, babe. But you know, that's just like weird. Like it's just like, like you put in like a straw with a port on your baby's penis. It's just like if, stop oh, it. if I if I ever did decide to, you know, and I from what you're saying, I would speak to a doctor and they would say don't do it. But in the in the hypothetical situation where I did do it. I would not have a rabbi go or any religious man who's not a doctor going anywhere near it. But then can you actually imagine like the world? So what you're doing is you're basically speaking, like you're taking the autonomy away from your child. Hmm. Well, you have to take autonomy away from your children to a certain extent. I am agreeing with you, but I mean... You... But not to mutilate them. Well, no. Well, that's the difference, isn't it? Let's just yeah. leave the anatomy of children alone. So, so the problem I have is not with the issue of FGM. It's I mean, I mean, I mean, male circumcision. It's basically when people say to me, "What about male circumcision? Why are you not doing anything about that?" And I just think, well, I don't have the time. That I hate what about I hate that. That's yeah. so annoying. Why would someone say that to you when you're working? What about another thing that's a different thing? Oh. 
because that because it only happens to women. So if you're doing feminism, people are like, well, what about heart disease? Like nobody says to people that do heart disease, but what about cancer? But when it comes to women and feminism, they were they were like, what about this? What about that? What about men? But what about male violence? And like you know, what about male victims? And I was like, great, like let's. I don't agree with the issue. Let's like you know, I want to help you send me your petition. So that's yeah. my thing was the fact that men that will say to me, what about male circumcision? And I was like, I don't support it, but yeah. like whatever. I've got a couple little questions left, just little ones. Uh, one of them is just because I sort of asked at the beginning and I feel like now we're sort of friends so I can ask properly. And that's just, I just because people are going to ask, I don't know if I got a very clear answer on can can women who have had FGM still achieve orgasms? You said that the men were bad or whatever. So that, if they do it themselves, presumably. Women that have FGM or, or have had FGM can orgasm. It's not a hundred percent for everybody. So like orgasms are not guaranteed for everybody, but it's all about knowing yourself, knowing what you like. So 80% of our clitoris is internal. So there's, there'll be like different things that will make them um, orgasm. And like I said in the book, like, you know, I don't like, you know, I can't put a finger on my first orgasm, but I had a hand in it. So you have to be able to get in there and know what really, like, you know, I can't, I can't say it's, it was like Tuesday, the 24th of July, but I know, like, you know, the reason why I'm able to have pleasure is because I know what I like and what I don't like. And I'm actually quite defensive about that. The whole point is like, a lot of people sometimes assume that what, like, you know, what they see on TV or whatever is like, this is how you would have, I think, have sex or what you should be doing. I think we need to empower young people more and we need to empower women and tell them what like you know when they can say no and what they, they can also be assertive about like you know things that they want or might not want so the answer is yes in principle okay you made a great point in the book as well about the way that sex is portrayed in movies and stuff because it's always like the first and second time in the movies and they don't really portray how it is for couples after 5 10 15 20 years and it's just not that way at all is that right yeah, because I just think, I don't know, I, I think for me, maybe because of the fact that there's like um, FGM was, was it, it is very much about ownership of the female anatomy. I've kind of regained ownership of mine. I just think that and I'm very, the idea of like not being able to be satisfied in a marriage, in a relationship is just something that I actually quite, I find like quite scary. Hmm. Yeah, I've got a couple of silly questions to end on. Are you ready? Okay, go on. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you feel about Michael Owen now? Because at the beginning of the book, you talk about how handsome he is. Um. So, well, he was. He was like. He's. I'm too tall for him now. Oh. And um. Hmm. And I'm also like. I, I think I'm like. I don't know. I don't think he would intellectually um, stimulate me anymore. <laughs> Have you heard him talk about stuff? No, but I'm just thinking like there's a kid, like one of the kids that used to fancy, do you know what I had? There was this weird thing the other day, which I just thought like, my God, what the hell? So there was a like, guy that I fancied, the first guy I ever fancied in school, which is also um, in the in the book as well, or maybe we had to take out his name. Um, but he, like we're the same age, when, and he looks so bad, but he has a kid who's about 13, 12, who looks exactly like him. And I was thinking, I'm going to fancy his 12 year old son because he looks like, <laughs> or his dad looks like, when I was 12, I was looking at the thing going like, this is just weird. I found the 12 year old and not the dad. So yeah, Michael, so I think I've I've learned, I've grown up and I've actually found like intellect and humor a lot more sexier. I don't think Michael Owen is funny. I, I heard him speak back in the day and that was like, I was like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But now, you yeah, know, I don't feel like that. But I still I still like Jason Orange. By... From Take That. Hmm. Yeah, Michael Owen is actually. You're right. He's known for being boring. He's only. I think he's watched. I think he said something like six films in his entire life. He's never watched more than that. You've dodged a bullet there. I don't fancy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's what I mean. Like it's like the first guy uh, um, that I was kind of in love with, and I thought I had to marry him. Imagine I just look at it now, thinking, my God, like imagine if I'd married yeah. him like like yeah. fifteen you'd, years ago, or whatever. You'd have a beautiful son, though, by the sounds of things. No, not the, no, that, that oh, was not no, him. that was the kid. I no, the one I fancied um, mm. in, in school, he was a white guy. I wasn't allowed to marry a white But I don't think I would have been allowed to marry him. Um, I'd probably marry a white guy now, but I think 10, 15 years ago, I would not have been allowed to marry a white guy. You also mentioned yeah. being attracted more now to some conservative Tory guys, particularly tall, slim ones. You didn't mention a name, but I mean, that's got to be Jacob Rees-Mogg, doesn't it? Jacob Rees-Mogg is hilarious and he's smart. Um, he's, but I just, I couldn't... 
I don't think, well, I don't think, and I know I can't ski with an anti-choice guy. So that's the only kind of it's very religious. thing. Yeah, I don't mind religious, but I just, like, you know, as long as, like, like the whole point is, like, each to their own in terms of that sense, but being anti-choice is like, but he's actually, you know what, he's actually a really nice person. Hmm. He can be a bit smarmy sometimes the in public. Like, maybe he's different in person. And he doesn't do that. Actually, he doesn't. It's just because I think people just take against him. And when he answers questions and, and he says things, he actually says it in a lovely kind of like, he's a, he's a, um, what, what's the word? He respects traditions. He kind of, like, you know, mm. acts in a way which, you, which a lot of people think that we shouldn't be acting. But ultimately, um, I think, yeah, I think he's hilarious. I would like, mm. I would like a pro choice, um, Jacob Smog. So banker, tall, boring. Yeah. Just, you know, I don't really go for, like, I said this to, what I said this to my ex once, and I said, I don't really go for looks, and he looked at me like this. I'm like, no, no, I mean, like, I go for, like, you're, like, you're good looking, but you're good looking because you're funny. Yeah. I just kept on going, and he's like, stop digging a hole. So, yeah, so Jacob Rees Mogg, if he was pro-choice, um, would okay. be quite cool. And then there's a guy that's, like, age appropriate, so between 45 and 55, that fits that. Like, you know, Jacob Rees Mogg, but pro-choice, then they should slide into my dms i think that sounds like my entire listenership to be honest i think you could be in with something here what is your listenership are they like <laughs> bankers with dry sense of humor but really smart yeah why not i don't even know uh they're all very nice they get in touch a lot and there's like i don't know 10 15 thousand of them um they're listening each week and it's quite a centrist sort of thing it's not very political but we tend to be sort of you know it's definitely not like a woke kind of thing and it's not uh nor is it Mm. Can we stop using the word woke? Because I really hate that. Because the whole point is like, it is good to be informed, but very few people like that talk about things that, whether it's about race or socio-economic issues, are actually informed about what they're talking about. And then we have this thing of saying, "Oh, the wokeness is bad." I'm like, well, do you know what? In this country, where we're doing so many unnecessary culture wars, and I just sit down, just thinking. It's too many bored white kids, and that's just like just needs to be able to just put on their barber and do whatever they need to do. But yeah, it's like, yeah. So um, if someone, anybody from the um, things can only get better generation. That's all my listeners. They're handsome, clever, funny people. Come on, everyone call. Should we put your number out there? No, just they can, they can slide into my DMs as the 21st century thing is. So either Instagram or Twitter. Okay. And they should follow you as they, well because they're fans of your work. Yeah, they can well. They can follow the foundation as well. The Five Foundation follow that. But like, don't like you know. Yeah, actually, I don't know. I don't know. It'll be, it'll be it'll be funny to meet somebody via a podcast. Yeah, that would be great. I hope someone does. And if they do, if someone does contact you through this, can you let me know? Because I really want to know. Yeah, but but they have to state that they say I heard you on a post- podcast. I heard your single. What's up? Okay, if anyone messages. That's what you've got to message, and it won't be creepy because you've. You have, to, you have to say that. How they, you have to say I, I'm I'm um, I'm messaging because of the podcast. Okay, yeah, and then you'll let me know because all all those people can let me know. Hey, I'm going to do it. What do you think? And then I'll sort of judge their photos and their sense of humour and yeah. go, yeah, I think go for it. <laughs> yeah, filter them. Oh, filter, ask them what their favourite like. Ask them what their favourite knock knock joke is. <laughs> well, the, the answer to that would yeah. be none of them, right? That's the best answer to that. No, but because like, like you know, they, if they can laugh at their own fun knock knock jokes, then it'll be fine. Okay, okay, fair enough. So there you go. So you could potentially you could like, you could have the key to unlocking my frozen eggs. <laughs> I found Nimco absolutely fascinating, and I really do love the work she is doing to end female genital mutilation. As for you, listener, I hope you feel just as passionate, and I'd also like to say well done on getting through the podcast despite the audio issues that made Nimco at times tough to understand. If you got this far, you are a true fan of the show, so give yourself a pat on the back. Check out the Five Foundation and catch Nimco on Twitter and Instagram at Nimco Alley with a K in the middle. If you're a single man, remember to slide into her DMs, which for the older people among you means uh, send her a message. A DM is a direct message, I think. Might be wrong. I'm on Andrew Gold underscore OK on both uh, Twitter and Instagram as well, or Facebook.com slash On the Edge with Andrew Gold, which is a bit of a mouthful to to write out. Can you write out mouthfuls? I don't know. Thank you to my new patron this week. That's the wonderful Eve Mackay. 
who sent a lovely email too with some great thoughts about the show. I've had a little reshuffle of the Patreon membership tiers and have added a section for bonus content. So from next week, there'll be a few minutes that maybe didn't make the show for those that want something extra. You can also opt into other perks such as early episodes that are totally ads free. For example, this one came out for patrons almost a week early. Do have a look and I'd be interested in your feedback too about what kinds of perks that would make you more likely to sign up. So that's patreon.com slash andrewgold. Remember please to leave a review on Apple. I got a nice one this week from Bonbon2 who said, I really enjoy this podcast, engaging host with interesting guests. Perfect to listen to during my lockdown three dog walks. I presume that's three dog walks per day, so I need to start producing a bit more content. Uh, I got another one from Carol G 59 who wrote, Sawadi Ka from Thailand. Have taken to listening to podcasts while out walking and now walk for hours to catch up on earlier episodes. Really, really enjoyable. An added bonus is I'm getting fitter. Well, I wish I could say the same, Carol, but I get so bored walking. I'm such a sedentary person. I need to get out of the house more. And on the walking theme, Ashley Marshall is in Hearn Bay in Kent, and most of her listening takes place on the seafront on long dog walks. So dogs are responsible for a huge percent of my listeners. So thank you, dogs. I love dogs. I got a whole bunch of lovely messages last week about Professor Sue Black. The reaction was amazing. As you'll recall, one of her many stories was about how she brought two heads back on a passenger plane. Well, long-time listener Alistair got in touch to say, My sister Lydia got stopped bringing a sheep's head back in her hand luggage from West Africa. My dad would have liked the present, but it got taken off her. Well... That's a shame. And that's a good way to end today's podcast with the sheep's head image. Next week, I've got Nicole Mitchell, a former church pastor. Pastor? Pastor's the thing you eat. Pastor. She's a former church pastor from a Baptist family who recently became a stripper and online nude model. After that, we've got some great guests coming up from Sadia Hamid, who was starved by her religious family, and Nett Herfkins, who survived a plane crash. Justin Brooks from the Innocence Project California, who talks about wrongly convicted prisoners. Imagine that. And Joshua Baker, who filmed with ISIS for a BBC documentary and the podcast, I'm Not a Monster. It's a full schedule, so buckle up. See you next week.